Hello, everybody. My name is Andy Hermanson. And good morning. My name is David Maxwell. And we're so excited that you made your way here uh, to worship at Lutheran Church of Hope. We're just a minute away. We just want you to know we believe it's no accident that you're here today. Thanks for tuning in. We are so glad that you're here. And if you are new to Hope, please click the New to Hope button on your screen and let us know where you are. Also, if you need prayer or would like prayer, please head over to our prayer wall at Lutheran Church of Hope dot org slash prayer wall yes uh that's a great opportunity to be church family what also is a great opportunity to be a part of church family is holy communion today uh we want you to be there and be a part of it so grab the wine or grape juice whatever it is uh to get ready for that part of the service we're also celebrating confirmation with our eighth graders from all our campuses and local sites uh, congratulations to all of those guys yes and communion sorry i talked communion bbs is coming up as well be sure and check out the website for registration on that Welcome to Hope. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope. We are so glad that you have joined us. Whether you're here in the room or you're joining us online, you guys know the drill. Let's stand together as we worship our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords together. Eighth graders, it's so great to see you. You guys look so nice. This is Sydney. She's going to lead us in this first song. Let's lift our voices together. Oh, 
Let's pray together. God, thank you for being our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, the God who breathes miracles into existence. God, thank you for being the God of impossible, that you are not too big for anything. God, thank you for your love this morning that washes over all of us, God, and I thank you for these eighth graders. I thank you for the work that you've done in their lives and the work that you'll continue to do in their lives as they proclaimed what they believe about you last Wednesday and they're going to be recognized here in just a few moments. God, I thank you for that and I thank you for this church family that surrounds them. God, even if we're not being confirmed this morning, I pray that we reflect. We reflect on the things that you have done in our lives, the ways that you have been at work throughout all of it, God, because you are in our stories. 
because you are a God who wants to be in relationship. You are a God who wants to be in community with us. We thank you for being a God that's not far away, but being a God that is right next to us all of the time. God, we give you this time this morning. We give you our hearts. We give you our worship. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Before you take a seat, let's say hi to those people around us. Let's make this a welcoming place. And then we'll continue with our Hope 360. This is Hope 360, your weekly look around Lutheran Church of Hope. I'm Jamie Richards. And I'm Mark Brandt. We want to extend a special welcome to the 500 plus eighth grade students joining us this weekend for confirmation. A few days ago, all these students stood before their family and friends to declare their faith in Jesus Christ. Their time together was joy filled, inspirational and full of emotions. Please join us in praying for each of these students and their families as we celebrate their faith journey ahead. With the end of the school year soon upon us, we want to invite high schoolers to the Ames Kairos Open House. Next week, May 4th, we are inviting juniors and seniors of Ignition to come worship with us at 8 o'clock at the link. Uh, we'll have pizza right before then, and then come enjoy the worship service and enjoy a great message from Danny. God wired us up to be in community with one another. That's why we have countless classes and events happening year round. And it's also why we encourage everyone to find a small group a group of people who meet regularly to grow in their relationship with God together. If you or someone you know is wanting to get connected with a small group, we invite you to join us for our next Hope Groups kickoff, which begins this Wednesday at 6.30. Throughout this class, participants will meet new people, form a group, and make a plan to continue meeting after the class is over. Learn more or sign up on our website. Lastly, the National Day of Prayer is coming up this Thursday, and we invite all Hopesters to join us in praying with others from all around the country on that day. Here at Hope, we have several opportunities within our prayer ministry for you to do that, and not just this Thursday, but all year round. I'm standing in the prayer labyrinth, which is one of the many opportunities that we have to engage in prayer around Hope, including our prayer pass, the online prayer wall, and others. But I want to also invite you to join us for Thursday prayer night beginning May 12th, where we can share in prayer as a group. Please join us. For more information on Prayer at Hope, visit hopewdm.org slash prayer. That was your 360 degree look around Lutheran Church of Hope. We're glad you joined us and welcome to Hope. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome here to Lutheran Church of Hope. My name is Justin Stofa. I'm on staff as our Power Life Junior High Minister. And we don't think it's any accident that you're here this morning. Whether you're visiting for the first time or you're new or you've been around for years, whether you're a young person or you're in eighth grade or older, we believe that God's led you here. So welcome this morning. We have some exciting news this morning. Uh, for starters, uh, there's a lot of things to celebrate today. It's just good to be in God's house together any weekend. But there are things that we want to highlight today. The first thing is that this past week, we received new members into our church family. And so if you're a new member who is at the new member class, one of the 188 new members to our church family, would you please stand so we can welcome you this morning? It is good to be the church. It's good to be part of a church that, this is not an organization, this is a church that's on a mission. We're a group of people that are on a mission for God and with God, the power of God working through us. If you're at the new member class, you know that our mission, as you learned or were reminded of, is to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. And so we want to invite you to, to, to jump in on that mission. If you want to serve, there are opportunities for you to be the hands and feet of Christ. If you want to give, if you feel called to joyfully give to the mission here at Hope, you can do that. You can do that online. Hello to everybody who's joining us online, by the way, as well. You can do that online. You can do that here in person. If you feel called to, to lead a class, to, to volunteer with our uh, youth ministry, you, you can get involved in a number of ways. If you want to take a class, I heard the financial peace offering uh, folks are here at the Connect, Grow, Serve. You're like, perfect. I've got some questions about finances. I would like to talk to someone after the service. Stop by and visit them afterwards. We are a church that are, we're unique. There are so many different gifts that God has given us. And so it's good to share those together with each other. Uh, it is also Confirmation Sunday. And I'm so excited to celebrate with our eighth graders who are sitting down here in the front rows. And we're going to do that in a moment. But before we do, we're going to start where we always start. And that's with God's word. So I've invited one of our confirmation students, Ben, to share uh, 
God's word, our scripture verse with us this morning. So Ben, would you please share the reading? The Bible reading for church today comes from the second Peter chapter one, beginning with the second verse. Grace and peace to you many times over as you deepen in your experience with God and Jesus, our master. Everything that goes into life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by letting, getting to know, personally and intimately, the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we ever received. So friends, confirm God's invitation to you. His choice of you, don't put it off. Do it now, do this, and you'll have your life on a firm footing, the streets paved on the way wide open into the eternal kingdom of our Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading. Well done. It takes a lot of courage to get up there as an eighth grader. I'm so thankful for all of you that are here today. These 75 eighth graders that are sitting down front, as you heard, represent the over 500 in our church family, Hope Wide, that are confirming their faith today. And as a reminder, maybe you're new to this confirmation process. And what is, is this a religious ceremony? Is this like a a rite of passage? Is this kind of like graduation, but in the church? No, those those don't tell the full story of what this is. The best way that I can describe it is from a, a church perspective, this is the affirmation of baptism. In baptism, to put it simply, God says, I love you. And confirmation is your response to that, to say, I receive that love, God, and I love you too. And I'm declaring my faith. I'm I'm on this journey with you. Anybody ever booked a a trip? Maybe you got a flight or a hotel or a reservation to a really great restaurant, and you get that confirmation number, and maybe you're like type A and you really write it down and put it in your pocket, or you're like me and you're like, oh yeah, what's the number? Are you ready? You're like, yeah, I'm ready. You kind of fake write the number. You get that confirmation. You're like, oh yeah. How, How foolish would it be if we said, I got confirmed, we're going on a trip. And then you just put that paper in your pocket and, and you never went to the airport and got on the plane. Or, or you never went to, and stayed at the five-star hotel. You, you never went to the restaurant and enjoyed the meal. But you said, but I was confirmed. It, no, how foolish. The same is true with confirmation in our faith. We're confirming that there's a place for us in God's kingdom. When we get there, there will be seats available. There will be a place for us at the table. And so this morning, this isn't the end of our journey. This is just a big moment where we're acknowledging we say yes, that God does love us. We're receiving that love. We know that there's a place for us in his kingdom, for us to serve, for us to love, forgive, and most importantly, to share that love with the world around us. And so this morning, since it's all about action, we're going to have you stand up. So right now, students, if you could just stand up, we're going to, in front of our church family, uh, share what it is. That it, what it means to be confirmed. So for starters, I've got the little red book so you know it's official, okay? I didn't just make this up. Somebody else wrote it down and it's really good tradition and I don't wanna miss it. And so here's what I want to start with. It's three questions, pop quiz, okay? You ready for this? I'm gonna give you the answers, okay? Don't worry. Here's the first question. This is what we're against, okay? This is what we don't stand for. So I have this question for you students. Do you renounce the devil? and all the forces that defy God. If so, say loud and clear, I renounce them. That was pretty convincing, right? Like, okay, we renounce the devil for sure. It's early, but we've said no to him. There are two more questions left. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? If so, say loud and clear, I renounce them. Even better. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? If so, say I renounce them. You've just made a declaration. You say, these things that get between me and God, I renounce those things. Those things have no place in my life. It's one thing to say what we're against, but it's another thing to say, well, here's what we believe. And so as a church family, we have this creed, the Apostles' Creed. We've learned it over the last three years, and our church family knows it. And we're going to take a moment this morning and recite that together because this is the core of what we believe. And so the words are going to be on the screen. And students, I invite you to recite this and to share it loudly. And congregation, if this is your belief as well, I'm going to encourage you to lift up your voices to remind these students here that this is a belief that all of us hold. So let's do that now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Could you hear those voices? You're part of a church family. This is bigger than just you declaring your faith. This is you saying, I want to join this chorus of voices to say, we're not in this on our own. We're better together. And so church family, I want to ask you a question too, because these students need your support, your continued encouragement. So my question for you is, do you promise to support these brothers and sisters in Christ and pray with them in their new life in Christ? If so, respond loud and clear. We do. And we ask God to help us. You got a lot of love out there, a lot of support with you in your faith journey. And because you just said you would pray for them and encourage them, I think we should just do that right now. We should just have a moment. And so if you're comfortable, would you please extend your hand towards these students or extend your heart as we pray a blessing over them and the the journey that God is calling them to. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these sons and daughters, for these students who you've called and who you've created. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that they would know your love for them is forever. Lord, stir within them the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind them that this world is infinitely better because of their existence. You've created them on purpose and for a purpose. And so, Lord, we pray that you hear our prayers and that you remind them that you are with us always to the end of the age. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. All right, you can have a seat. In a moment, we're going to acknowledge each of these students. It would be tempting just to go, you saw them, right? You saw the back of their heads. You get it. Big church, let's just move through. But this moment is too important. This moment is too important to not acknowledge the power of God's story moving in and through the lives of each one of these students. So in a moment, students are going to be uh, ushered into place and their leaders are going to proudly read the names of each student. You're going to get to see a picture. Students, when your name's called, if you could wave and smile. You don't have to smile. You can wave. You can smile. It'd be good. You're going to get a chance to see this church family who you've heard that has the same belief as you. And church family, you're going to get to see these students. You know, so often people say, you know what? The problem is young people in this world. Oh, young, they're so distracted. They get off course. They've got no moral boundaries. They're just off course. And I I wonder if God's not going to show up in their life. And I can tell you with great confidence that that, that God is moving in a powerful way in this generation. Not only do I see it, but I've heard it. I've witnessed the way that they serve, the way that they care for each other, the way that they see value in each other. And I've heard it declared when they share their faith statements. And in a moment, you're going to hear their voices Just a sample of a few voices. Each one of them wrote their own personal story of their journey. Honest, powerful, courageous of what it means to declare their faith. And so I pray as you you hear these voices, you'll get a glimpse of what that means. Because there's power in their voice. It reminds me of the the gift that we're going to give you. Each student's going to get this small gift, this cross. There's power in this cross. There's nothing more powerful than this gift that you're about to receive, that you're accepting, that you're confirming. There were people thousands of years ago who lived in a different country, in a different culture, who spoke a different language, who said, we've encountered the the living God in Jesus. Not only did he die on the cross, but he rose from the grave, and we've encountered that love, and it changed everything. And they said, there's people in this world who need to hear this message. And so they took up their cross. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And so they took that message, and they went across oceans. They learned new languages. They're like, they speak English? What's that? English? They speak English? Okay, we'll learn English so that we can make sure they know God's love for them in their own language. And that cross, that message, that power, it's shown up here today. And my prayer is that you would receive that. And not only would you receive that, but as you take these crosses with you, that you would take it out into the world. Think about this for a moment. 75 young people right here. A room full of people. We gather and we worship. Where will this message of the cross go from here? Think of the future generations who will be blessed because of your confirmation today. Future sons and daughters and grandkids, future family members and neighbors and friends and coworkers, all because you're saying, today I'm taking a stand. This is what I believe. And so as you see these students and you hear their voices, I want you to be thinking about that and praying a blessing over their life.
So let's listen to these faith statements as students get into their place, and then we'll celebrate each and every one of them. Take a look. I have been given this incredible gift to share with you today, my faith statement. My name is Bennett, and this is my faith statement. I always grew up believing in God, but never really stopped to understand what it meant to be a true follower of Christ. Just because I was born into a Christian family doesn't mean that I always understood God or what Christianity truly was. I started my faith journey when I was younger. I knew who God was and to believe in Him, but never really understood why until I went through Power Life. When I started Power Life in sixth grade, I didn't really know what to expect. I just knew a lot of my friends went. I am so blessed to have friends that shine God's light each and every day. I have learned so much and become aware of God's plan for each and every one of us. I have a different mindset knowing that I have a life in heaven and God is always watching over me. Once I truly understood the power of God's love, I got baptized. Worshiping is my favorite thing. It fills me with the Holy Spirit. As teenagers, we are going through this pressure at school and through our daily lives of figuring out who we are and what we will do in this world. There are multiple distractions between us and God. Drugs, money, alcohol, and everyday activities. He knows my sins and still chooses to forgive me and love me for who I am. I know the reason He died for us and that is because He wanted me to be with him forever. I know God will love me and be with me no matter what. There have been many times in my life where I notice that God is with me or guiding me. I may not be perfect, none of us are, but I know from now on I, I will strive to do my best and live how God would want me to live. My favorite verse is Romans chapter 12, verse nine. It states, do not just pretend to love others, really love them, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 to 12 says, For I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and to hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. Now I want to talk about a verse that I will keep with me until the day I die. Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am so very grateful to be one of God's children. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Another verse that is important to me is Romans 8.39 No power in the sky above or in the earth below will ever be able to separate from us from the love of God that revealed in Christ Jesus. This is powerful for me because it says that basically nothing can take away from my love with God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am anointed to bring hope which comes from Luke 4, 18. God is there for me every step of my journey. I am excited to see my relationship with God get stronger. The Holy Spirit led me here, and for now, my calling is serving others. I am also really excited for my kids to grow up as Christians and know that they are saved by Him, and no matter where they are, He is always by their side and will always love them. Most of all, I can't wait to continue to shine my light for Jesus and run with perseverance the race marked out for me until I get to go back home to heaven. The prophet Isaiah said, the word goes out and it does not come back empty or void. And, and the word has gone out into the hearts and minds of these students. And so now I want to say thank you to the families who have shared your students with us, who have encouraged them in their faith, to the friends who have continued to support them in their journey. But I, I want to give a special praise to God for these people that you're about to meet. And it's the leaders. Would you praise God for the leaders who've walked with them in their journey? In just a moment, the leaders are going to come up, introduce themselves, and the whole group's going to be celebrated together. We're better together. Students are going to raise their hand, and we're going to hold our applause, and we're going to celebrate for the entire group. So with that, our first group. I'm Tisha Hall, and this is Allison Hardy, and these are our girls of 8E. Taylor Corson, Tori Crosby, Avery Fagan, Cadence Hammond, Kenna Harskamp, Gianna Lavarado, 
Allie Pressler, Evan Ringana, Cameron Sly, and Lily Strzok. I'm Angie Mulbauer, and our group is 8H. Faith Rose Christensen, Bentley Taylor Flaherty, Maya Lynn Grinleaf, Cadence Sue Kesey, Kendall Marie McDonough, Skylin Alice Mulbauer, Hannah Ray Powers, and Ava Grace Stein. I am Michelle, and this is Katie, and we are group 8J. Madeline Blomgren, Avery Brandt, Pearl Brown, Aaron Cochran, Mia Gavin, Aubrey Holcomb, Elsie Johnson, Cambry Livingston, Caitlin Tolson. Good morning, I'm Patrick Corcoran. And I'm Steve Carlson, and we've had the honor and the privilege of leading Group 8N. And our students are Ben B. Adams, Beckett Lee Baker, Keegan James Curlot, Nick Denville, Dylan Bradley Donovan, Noah Leland Henricks, Braden Patrick Holcomb Seaman, Tyson J. Kalb, Ryan David Langling, Brady A. Nickel, Lucas Peterson, Colt David Shipper, Owen Paul Tweet, Kane Joshua Van Dis, Cam Cole Vise. Hello, I'm Curtis Malone. Uh, mm. We we have Rusty Group 8-0. Group 8-0. Sorry. <laughs> Group 8-0. Uh, we've got Kyler Anderson, Alex Argotsinger, Blake Bullerman, Colin Corcoran, Evan Dannenauer, Tyler Etten, Jacob Huell, Zach Jacobitz, Caleb Kesey, Jackson Keith, Logan Nicely, and Jesse Lindsay. Hudson Kirchell, Charles Malone, Braden McCraney, Liam Reed, Paxson Saker, Cole Schott, Jackson Sturdivant, Logan Sutter, Jackson Tracy, Dylan Wishman, and Cade Yeager. I'm Amanda Hetland, and this is Kate Jones, and we've had the pleasure of leading 8R. We have Lucas Ross Hetland, Gabriel Robert Jones, Keaton Lee Menon, Corey Thomas Oliver, Ryder Thomas Rasmussen, Jace Shane Sloan, and Kagan P. Wigant. And just for good measure, one more time, praise God for this confirmation class of 2022. Yeah, let's take a look around, church. I, I want to kind of be your tour guide today, but I'm not the one leading the tour. I, I'm the one following the one who leads the tour, who is Jesus. And so I just want to invite you to come along with Jesus, uh, with me, with all those uh, in the history of the church who follow this Lord, this Savior, this one who gives new and everlasting life. Welcome, everybody. Uh, congratulations, eighth graders. Listen to me, we love you. We absolutely love you. Uh, your leaders love you. Your small group leaders, by the way, are the heroes of this church. Praise God for them one more time. Awesome job, thank you. You are truly loved in this church uh, by the pastors, the staff, the ministry leaders, 
uh, the people around you. I, I love the setting of this, and, and this goes out to all the campuses who are tuning in right now of hope. There are 500 plus of you who are confirming your faith as eighth graders today, having completed the three-year Power Life Confirmation curriculum and done the studies and the service and the community stuff and the worship and all the things that you've done to discover what it means to be a part of the church, what it means to be the church. But it can be confusing, as you saw in that clip from a movie called Raising Helen, the Kate Hudson character, whose name is Helen, is trying to get her uh, nieces and nephew into this Lutheran school in New York City. And she runs into Pastor Dan, or she calls him Father Dan or Park, Father Parker, and he's Pastor Parker. But that, regardless, if you want to call me Father Mike, that's wrong, but it's okay. I am a dad of three. My kids call me a father, so that works out. But it's just different pieties and traditions, and that's the thing. When we take those pieties and traditions too seriously, we lose it. And we can do that with confirmation today if we aren't careful. We can turn this just into a tradition. We can just turn this into a misunderstanding of just how powerful it is, just how cool this is, of how big of a deal this is for what you're doing. It's worth getting dressed up for. It's worth family coming from out of town for. It's worth celebrating. It's worth dating photo ops after the service. It's worth all of it because it's coming from God to us. The rite of confirmation traditionally and this is a misunderstanding. It's so easy to misunderstand, like Helen does in that clip, what it means to be a Lutheran or what it means to be a part of a church or what it means to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus. I don't want you to misunderstand. I want you to know. To be a Christian, to be a part of a church family is a gift that God gives to us. When we make it all about ourselves, we say things like, and traditionally this is what confirmation can become. The rite of confirmation is some, somehow a prerequisite to come to Holy Communion, to, to be eligible for the Lord's Supper. Or it's somehow a prerequisite in order to be a full church member of the body of Christ in a particular congregation, to put your name on the rolls. There's nothing particularly wrong with that, as long as you know it's tradition, it's not Bible. To be Lutheran at its core is about way more than lefsa, ludifisk, and liturgy. It's about God's word. Luther started the whole Reformation, Martin Luther did, based on the principles of this. He said, we are going to focus on Jesus Christ. We are going to bring the church back to this. We're going to reform the church, and we're going to bring it back to Jesus Christ. And we're going to follow the word that's proclaimed by Jesus through the scriptures. And we're going to focus in on the grace that he pours out for all of us. Amazing as it is, this grace. And we're going to put our trust and our faith in this Jesus. And God's word that says if you believe in Jesus and you receive him, you confirm that faith, God gives you the power to become his very own children. And here's the thing about that relationship between God as your father and you as his daughter or you as his son. It's going to last forever. It's going to last forever. There is no other relationship in this world that is guaranteed to last forever like this one. There is no other relationship that has the power to destroy death for you, to forgive sins for you, to kick open the door to heaven for you, to breathe new life into you right here and right now. So confirming faith in this one, in this relationship that God establishes with us through Jesus Christ is what confirmation is all about. It's what church is all about. But when we get too locked into our traditions and our pieties and our, and our denominational kinds of ways that we do things, we miss that. As good as those traditions might be, one of the greatest Lutheran theologians, uh, Christian theologians, a German guy named Helmut Thielicke, uh, famously said this, amongst many, many other great things that he said. Deep thinker, he says, you know, let's stop taking ourselves so seriously. A church is in a bad way when it banishes laughter from the sanctuary and leaves it all to the nightclubs or the comedy clubs. This is where joy should be most embraced and experienced. This is where we should stop taking ourselves so seriously. Wherever you are right now, wherever you hear my voice, and there's still a lot more people online than there are in person, even though there's a lot of people here uh, today, and I'm glad I wore a tie. So I, I, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you know what? It's not about me. Go ahead and just say that. It, it's, not about, it's, it's not about me. Life isn't. Usually I have you say it's not about you, but I wanted you to own it today. It's not about me either. It's not about our traditions, because our traditions don't save us. It's not about our denominations, because our denominations don't save us. It's not what we're confirming today. 
It's not just eighth graders who have an opportunity to confirm their faith today. You do know, right, biblically, that confirmation is something that we're called to do, all of us, every day of our lives as we follow Jesus. To wake up every morning, this would be a good spiritual discipline and habit, and say, I want to live this day not for me. It's not about me, God. But I want to live this day for your glory. I want to see where you lead me. I want to follow you instead of trying to drag you along into pursuing all of my stuff that isn't going to give me that joy, that isn't going to give me a peace that passes all human understanding, that isn't going to breathe new life into me. I've been duped. I've been tricked into thinking that it can. But I want to give it to you now, God. I'm confirming my faith and my trust in that. That's what we're doing here. The Jesus who comes along and says, follow me. That's who we're following. And just in case we... We think that that's just like an obscure verse off by itself. Jesus says it over and over again. He says, I'm the way. And just in case we start thinking it is about me, that religion, that Christianity, that spirituality is all about the things that we got to do in order to earn God's favor, in order to stand righteous before a holy God. Jesus says, you know, you didn't choose me. I chose you. That whole thing about you have to make a decision for Jesus, that's not in the Bible, that's tradition. The Bible, Jesus says, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I made a decision for you. And all you have to do is believe it and receive it. All you have to do is take it in. All you have to do is confirm it. So come on this journey with me, Jesus says. Our Bible reading for today from 2 Peter says, so friends, confirm. There's that word, confirmation. Confirm. Confirm God's choice in you. Confirm God's invitation to you. In choosing you, his choice of you, don't put it off. Do it right now. That's why we call this ministry Power Life, because it's a life changer. John chapter 10, verse 10 is our theme verse that we started with over 20 years ago. And look what God has done. God has grown this into the largest Lutheran confirmation ministry, I'm pretty sure, on planet Earth. There's nothing else quite like it, because we looked at it and we said, well, what does the Bible say about confirmation? What does Scripture say? What is God's word? Not just tradition. Traditions are great. But let's make sure our traditions are in alignment with God's word. And look what God does. Look how he blesses it when we go there, when we surrender it to him, when we don't get confused and and start thinking that there's a blood test to get into church or there's something we got to do in order to earn it on the way in. We want you to have a powerful life. And so Jesus says, I came to give you this life so that you could have it to the full, a real and eternal life. More and a better life. Everybody say better life. Shout out power life. life. We have this tradition. We started over 20 years ago when I was teaching confirmation. I'd say, I'd teach this John 10, 10, and I'd say, so get a life. And the students would shout back power life. I don't want to just leave them on an island by themselves because we all have the same opportunity today to confirm our faith. It's a bigger, more formal deal for them today. They're going through the rite of confirmation. But each and every day, biblically speaking, we're invited to confirm our faith. So, get a life! Come on, shout it out! Get a life! Jesus says, I'm the way. I'll be your tour guide, so let's follow him. For a lot of us, it starts here, or a place like here, in the waters of holy baptism, where once upon a time, you were baptized. 63 of our eighth graders in this, in this campus alone in West Des Moines were baptized recently, our Power Life students. Because they came to faith. They came to that place in their heart where they said, even if it's the childlike faith, even if it's just a mustard seed of faith, the Bible says. And so baptism is the mark of that faith. But as Lutheran Christians, we don't just baptize believers. We do that. We also baptize infants. And I know it can get a little bit of a a debatable point. And Christians have debated this for at least a few centuries. Before the 1500s, there was really no debate on this. But over the, it's sort of a modern debate. And there are people who say, well, you can't get baptized if you don't understand what's going on. Let me just use a quick kind of metaphorical story. If you had a baby who was born in September, or a grandchild, or a niece, or a nephew, or a neighbor kid, or a co-worker's kid, or somebody you care about and love. If you had a baby in your life who was born the end of September, and three months later, here comes Christmas, do you say, no presents for the baby? No gifts for the baby because the baby will not understand the gift. The baby does not have an intellectual comprehension of the Christmas gift that we're giving, so it's absolutely pointless for us to give the gift. Or does the gift depend on the giver of the gift? If you give the gift, 
It happened. Baptism is not about me. It's not about you. It's not about what we have to do to earn it or receive it. Biblically speaking, yes, I know, people come to faith and then they get baptized. It's kind of the norm. But in that same book of Acts that describes these stories of people coming to faith, one person in a household would come to faith sometimes and the entire household would be baptized, including the kids who were younger than an age of accountability, unless we just assume none of them were. There seems to be no concern about that in the Bible at all. So we choose to err on the side of grace. But baptism isn't the end. It's not a life insurance policy for heaven. It's the beginning. God gives the gift. He pours down his love for us. I mean, physically you can just see it personified in, in this font. The water of life pours down from heaven to us on earth. The, the limestone in, in, I'm sorry, the marble in the middle from the Holy Land where Christ resided breaks through the limestone from Iowa. The extraordinary breaks through the ordinary of our lives. The miraculous to us, the infinite to the finite, symbolized here in the living water of God pouring out for us. For some, this is where the whole journey with Jesus begins. Whether we understand it or not, the gift is given. And if the little baby, it's not like a little three-month-old's gonna say, I believe! I mean, that would be extraordinary. <laughs> and a little weird. But it's the parents' faith and the church's faith upon which we baptize because this is the beginning of the journey. And then Jesus says, come on. Come on, it doesn't end there. We, we don't just get our kids done. Come on, get to know Jesus Christ. And the way you get to know God and the identity of God the most, we're born into God's family in the waters of baptism, but we're saved by the God who loves us so much he sent his son Jesus into this world to die for us. And through his death, your death is put to death. Your sin is crucified. And then Jesus says, come on, get to know me even more on a more regular basis. And I'll meet you here at this family meal, this church family meal that we're gonna have in just a few minutes. Through the bread and the wine of an old traditional, traditional religious meal, the Passover. Jesus says, new deal now to his followers, to any of us who follow him. The bread of the Passover meal, from now on, this is my body, given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. And the next night he gave up his body for the forgiveness of sins for the whole world, for all who put their faith in him. After that, he took the cup of the Passover meal, the wine, and he says, this cup now, new deal, new covenant, in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. And so we're born into God's family, a lot of us in the waters of baptism, I and mean, there can be different routes along the way. But the key is we're following Jesus to all these places. We're in, we encounter the power of God's love, the eternal life-saving power of God's love through the cross of Jesus Christ. And then please don't minimize this part. We're invited to the family table of God. But the Bible says is a foretaste of the heavenly feast to come. Just a glimpse, I mean it's communion in a Lutheran church, so it's a little, little teeny tiny taste of kind of almost tasteless bread. And it's a sippy cup for kind of, it's a smaller than a sippy cup, it's a, it's, it's a shot glass minimized to the minus smallest kind of drip of wine that you could possibly have. And is it good wine? No, it is not. <laughs> it's Mogan David, it's, it's fresh. None of these old year stuff. It's, it's the stuff just right off the vines yesterday, right? We, we just made it. But it's not the bread and the wine. It's the power of God's promise behind the bread and the wine. Listen to it. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. What I'm giving to you in this meal, you can't get anywhere else. It's the most powerful, most meaningful meal you'll ever have this side of heaven. And then in heaven, it'll be a feast, the Bible says. So we remember Jesus in this meal. We remember his amazing grace poured out for us. And we remember this, you're invited. Your place at God's table is reserved in the kingdom of heaven. It's been confirmed, as Justin said earlier in the service. On the way, Jesus says. So follow me. Follow me on this tour. And that goes for everybody who can hear my voice right now. That goes for me too. You don't stop when you get confirmed. 
You know the old joke about the Lutheran pastor, the Catholic priest, and the Baptist preacher, and they all get together and they're lamenting that they all have the same problem. They have bats in their belfry, where the church bells are, in the big tower outside of their old traditional church buildings. And they're just saying, oh, this is just terrible. The Baptist preacher says, I tried to do an altar call for the bats, but they wouldn't come. And we still have bats in the belfry. The Catholic priest says, I burned incense up the belfry tower, and it didn't smoke them out. They're still there. I can't get rid of the bats in the, in the belfry. The Lutheran pastor says, we used to have the same problem, but we don't anymore. And the, the Baptist preacher and the Catholic priest both say the same thing. So, well, what did you do? How did you get rid of the bats in the belfry? I just baptized and confirmed them, and I haven't seen them since. That's a problem. <laughs> but we're laughing because it's too often true. You know what's sad about that? You've been given a ticket. You've been given a gift. You've been given this incredible gift. The most valuable gift you'll ever receive. And you're going to put it on a shelf? You're going to say, I got more important things to do in high school? Or in college? Or in young adulthood? or in middle age, or in my senior years? What could possibly be more important than taking this tour every day of our lives and saying, God, where do you want to lead me today? Where are we going to go? I want to live for your glory, not mine, because when I try to live for my glory, I notice something, that even when I achieve it, it doesn't satisfy my soul. Have you figured that one out yet? That even when you get it, when you accomplish it, oh, if I could just do that, I'd be full. Is it enough? Or are you still looking for something more? Along comes Jesus, says, I got a better way for you. Come get born again into my family, again and again and again and again. Remember your identity, who you are as a child of God, brought into the family of God through the waters of baptism. Encounter the power of my saving grace through the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember your seat at the table. Remember you're included. Remember it's gonna last forever. And it's a promise of God. So what we're doing here, confirmation, when you all eighth graders just walked across, I mean, I, I'm almost in tears. Because some of you I've seen grow up, I, I baptized you as a little baby, some of you. And now you're confirming that baptism. The yes that Jesus said to you in baptism and at the cross and at the Lord's table, now you're standing up and publicly saying yes. Yes, I believe it. Yes, I receive it. And so John chapter 1 says, you have the power to become children of God for the rest of your eternal lives. Now keep confirming it. Because as Justin said, confirmation is not a graduation. I know it kind of looks like that, right? They all kind of walk across the stage. They're going to get certificates when it's all done. And those are important things. It's worth it. These are traditions that are worth embracing. It's a great tradition. But it's not a... It's not a completion of a cycle. It's quite the opposite. It's the beginning of a whole new journey where you just keep going around and around. And you follow Jesus. And then you go out there and you live out your Christian life in a daily way. Confirmation is not crossing a spiritual finish line. It's marking and celebrating a major milepost in your ongoing faith journey. I can't emphasize enough. Your ongoing faith journey. Because you got confirmed today, all the more you're saying, I'm in with you, Jesus. I'm all in with you. Because I want to live the life that my creator created me to live. Instead of spinning my wheels and chasing the wind and going after all this stuff that isn't soul satisfying. It's like that clip from the movie Hoosiers. It's the greatest movie of all time, or at least in the top ten. Where the coach says to Strap. Strap is the pastor's kid in Hickory. This little underdog uh, Indiana town that's on its way to a state championship. Strap's a bench warmer. He doesn't play. He's not very good at basketball. He's got other gifts. But the team gets in foul trouble, so the coach says, Strap, you're in. you got to get into the game. You've been given this opportunity. As you watch this clip, understand, eighth graders. Understand everybody who can hear my voice right now. You are being called into the game. God wants you on the floor. Take a look. <laughs> In other words, stop shooting. That was lucky. Listen to me, eighth graders. God wants you on the floor. 
God wants you in the game. God wants you to run with him, to go his way, to follow him. Because that's where the good life is. You say, well, I got, I got other things that are a little more important to me right now. I got other things that are priorities. I got, I got other things I need to focus on. Because I love you, I'm going to tell you this. And everybody else can listen too, because it's for all of you too. And it's for me too. You don't have anything more important than this. Not one thing. There is not one thing in your life that's more important than this journey with Jesus Christ. Seek first the kingdom of God, the Bible says. Then all these other things. All these other important things. There isn't one thing in your life that's more important than accepting Jesus' invitation than confirming your faith day after day after day after day. Because this is where you find the joy. Untouchable. This is where you find the peace that passes all human understanding. This is where you find the new life. This is where it is. And it's nowhere else to be found. There's nothing more important in your life than what you're doing here today and what Jesus calls all of us to do every day. Yesterday, I could not have been more excited when I got home from church. Uh, a guy who's a member of our church, Chase Allen, signed a contract with God's team, <laughs> the Chicago Bears. Uh, Chase is really active. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the eight Bears fans in the church are like, yeah, that's awesome. We got Chase, six foot seven, athletic freak. Iowa State captain for all these years. Just, just, and, you know, you say, I say that and everyone's like, yeah, man, that's, that's got to be the most important thing in his life. You don't know Chase. Chase has been a leader in our college ministry, Kairos up in Ames. He, he volunteers, he serves, he gives. He was the angel at Journey to the Light this year, up on the wall, on the video. That was Chase, the guy with the long flowing locks of red hair that I wish I had. Chase now is a Chicago bear. He's on the team. You're like, well, that'd be the ultimate, right? For some, not everybody's goal. Some of you want to play on lesser teams. <laughs> but one of my favorite people, my favorite tight end on planet Earth and my favorite team got together last night. He signed a contract. What if he signed that contract? He's like, ah, I'm not going to camp. I'm not going to play. I'm not going to try out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, oh, thanks for the offer. Thanks for the contract. I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that. You've been given this ticket, the Bible says. We were also given absolutely terrific promises, our Bible reading for today says. Your tickets to be participants in the life of God. At the NFL draft, which was in Las Vegas, this spectacle of a city meets this spectacle of a thing called the NFL draft. I don't know why sports fans like me get into the draft, but we just do. It's like, with the 33rd pick... In the 2022 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select somebody you've never heard of. Woo! Or we start tweeting, that's the worst pick ever! Like you know. You never saw the guy play, but you heard somebody say something about something and you think you need a defensive player when it's an off or whatever it is. But that's just, you know, how we do it. And then it's this spectacle because the best players, the ones they know are going to get drafted, probably in the first round are all invited, 30 or so players. And then they get to do their 15 seconds of fame walk and all the cameras and the white hot artificial lights of Vegas are all on them. Three national networks are showing it all live. Three, live. 150,000 people are there on the ground cheering, woo! What could possibly be better than that moment? Well, for people like Chase Allen, it's what you did here today, eighth graders. It's confirming your faith in Jesus Christ. I don't mean to suggest that Chase doesn't care about this. He's super pumped. I texted him. He, he's like, he's a really excited about this, as he should be. But whatever you pursue in life, do it all for the glory of God. The number one pick in the, in the draft, Trayvon Walker, Edge rusher from Georgia, unlimited potential. He could be the greatest defender ever, or he could be a complete, complete bust, you don't know. But they picked him number one based on that potential. And so you think, well, when they name him the number one pick, he's going to come walking in, all the lights and the cameras are going to be on him, and everyone's going to go, woo, did you notice? Those of you who watched, where was he? At home with his family, 
with his pastor. I'm just saying, if you ever get drafted, <laughs> I'm available <laughs> for the post announcement prayer, all right? <laughs> Gladly we'll do that. But there's a picture behind me of, of Trayvon hugging his father, his mother's on his other side, his family's around him, his neighbors, his church, all the people around him. And they're celebrating. And when asked, why didn't you go to the draft? Why didn't you show up, show up for that moment? What could possibly be better than being famous on YouTube or having the most TikTok followers? What could possibly be more important than, than everybody knowing your name? Jesus knowing my name. The one who gives me life forever and new life right now. I'm a family guy, Trayvon Walker is quoted as saying in his, his press conference the next day. I like being around people who genuinely care about me. I'm not down with the fake love. So I don't need Vegas this weekend. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just that that shows his heart. He goes on to say, the number one priority for me, there's nothing more important. Not being drafted number one, nothing is more important than my relationship with God. Listen to me. If you want to be truly rich, richer than anybody you know, you're going to have to invest in relationships. Your relationship with God and your relationship with one another, your sisters and brothers in Christ, the people that you just did confirmation with for the last three years. Keep doing it as you get into Ignition, the high school ministry here at Hope, as you continue to be a confirmed part and a member of this body of Christ called Lutheran Church of Hope. Keep activating your faith, and this goes for all of us. If you want to get rich, invest in relationships. The Bible says this. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. All the things that Christians do. Yes, forgive people, it says in Colossians 3. Yes, be patient. Yes, uh, have a humble spirit. Yes, do all these things. Yes, come to worship. Sing your spiritual songs. Praise God. Do all these things, but above Above all, clothe yourselves with love. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, yes, there are all these gifts in the church. There are teachers. There are caregivers. There are people who serve. There are missionaries. There are people who go out. There are leaders. There are all these different gifts. There are miraculous gifts. People who can heal the sick with prayer. People who can speak in tongues. People who can prophesy and see God's vision for the future. You could, you could strive after spiritually these miraculous gifts, but then Paul and the Bible puts it as bluntly and directly and simply as any Anything has ever been written. But of all these gifts, the greatest, the ones that are going to give you the most life, are faith. How's your faith? Hope in Jesus Christ. Are you holding on to that? Even in difficult times? And love. And the greatest of these is love. If you want to be rich, you're going to have to get better at that. You're going to have to invest more in that. Because that's where true wealth is to be found. You've got God's word on it, not preacher's opinion. Over and over and over again, Jesus says, this is the greatest commandment. Love God with everything you've got and love others the way I have loved you. Believe this. That's how we confirm our faith. Believe it and receive it and God gives you the power to become his very own children. Believe it, but then hold on to it. Don't be the bats in the belfry at the Lutheran church who get baptized and confirmed and they disappear. You know, the greatest tragedy in that story would be for those who disappear not for the church because you'd be missing it you'd be missing the life that your maker made you to live out the journey the pathway from the waters of baptism to the cross of Jesus Christ to the bread and the wine of this meal so believe it that's what you're doing today you're saying I believe it even if it's just a tiny mustard seed of faith I believe it and then keep that faith Hold on to the hope that God gives you, the Bible says. Our Bible reading for today, do these things and you will never fall away. You will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No one else can give you this. So nothing is this valuable. It's about your relationship with God, your life is. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about our relationship with God. It's about living for his glory. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And it's about taking that love that God gives to us, putting our trust in it, 
And then it just naturally starts to pour out of us to the world around us. Suddenly we don't need everybody around us to be perfect. Suddenly we start having some grace for people too, just like God has for us. Well, we've received it, why wouldn't we give it? It's the only place to get this life, to get it right, to find the life that you've always been looking for. So, I'll close it the way we always close a Power Life Confirmation. Get a life! Turn it over to the campus pastors for communion. I want to invite the communion servers to come to their stations here at this campus. This is a simple meal, but it's profoundly important. In the night in which he's betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, and gave it for all to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this to remember me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Come and receive it with faith. Confirm your faith today in that way. And it's done to you. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. So together, let's pray our table grace, the Lord's Prayer, before this Lord's Supper. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The ushers will direct you uh, to the nearest station. If you're new to Hope, I want you to know you're welcome at this table. Doesn't matter what your denomination is. It matters that you believe in the Jesus who invites you, that you know you have a seat at this table. Come and receive it with faith and it's done to you. Uh, take the wafer or the bread and then take the cup. The wine is red, it's alcoholic. The grape juice is white, it's non-alcoholic. The grape juice is in the center of the tray. The alcoholic wine is on the outside of the tray. So choose accordingly. Gluten-free stations are available over on the sides. Go over there if that's what you need. As we receive these gifts from God, receive them with faith, receive them with belief, and then hold on and keep to that faith as we confirm it and we get a life, a power life. Uh, as you do, we can sing, we can worship, and then after that, there'll be a blessing, and after the blessing, it's photo op time.
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. I invite you to stand and sing. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you all and keep you in his grace that's amazing unto eternal life in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord and get a life. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. What, what a powerful reminder. Number one, that there is a life available, a power life available to us. If you want to pursue that, right? God is not done with us yet. There are new steps to be able to jump in and investing in relationships is always key. So uh, hopefully you took something away from that as well. We're glad you're here today. And we hope that you will join us again next week. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.